All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Don. I'm INE's Director of Community, and welcome to this final day of INE's Cybersecurity Week. As you may have heard through a number of different things that we've been doing uh, this week, through the webinars and the articles and what have you, uh, but if you don't know much, much about INE, let me just share what our mission is. It's basically our mission to be the world's leading provider of hands-on, role-based technical training, and we are maniacally focused on developing experts in the areas of cybersecurity, networking, cloud, data science, and several other topics as well. We often like to at least think of ourselves as experts at making you an expert. We hope that you've enjoyed everything that we brought you this entire week. We're totally thrilled with the job that the entire INE team has done to bring you this wonderful week of content. And uh, with that, let's uh, take a look at what we actually did see this week. And as we go through this little uh, list of things that we have done, keep in mind that everything you see here is already on the INE.com website. So you can go take a look at the recordings of the previous two webinars that we did, as well as all of the articles, blog posts, and videos that we released throughout this entire week dedicated to cybersecurity. Now, as you probably figured out, it was our intention to give you a nice mix of general information about the industry, as well as diving into some of the specific uh, techniques of a job role or performing something within security. So with that, we started off with a look at cybersecurity in 2021 and what's happening now. So we took a, a little unique look with myself and Chris Leach at some of those things that were not so obvious to cover when it comes to current events but how they applied to people who are working in cybersecurity as a profession. Well, on Tuesday, we did a couple cool things. So first of all, we released a video by uh, Neil Bridges on a day in the life of a security team. So he gave you a really good idea of what the day-to-day -day activity is and some of those job roles. But we also released a blog post by our very own Lily Clark on her journey of going from zero technical experience to earning her, her EJPT, or the eLearn Security Junior Pen Testing Certification. So her story is very inspiring. Uh, go check out that blog post. There's also some resources in there for you to follow in her footsteps, if, so, uh, if you were so inspired by her as we were. In addition to that, we also did an Ask Me Anything session where Lily was featured on the unofficial INE eLearn Security Discord server. So go check that out. Um, I'm sure you'll really enjoy it. On Wednesday, I did a separate webinar on IoT Hacking 101, where I attacked a smart plug and also kind of gave you a little bit of history behind uh, hacking, what is IoT, kind of mixed it all together and showed you some of the strange things that we can actually accomplish. And it really wasn't that difficult. Well, on Thursday, we released a video from our BizTech Blueprint webinar series on i &E, and this one was on building skills from multi-cloud enterprise with our resident cloud and Azure expert, Tracy Wallace, along with our PR director, Catherine Brown. And then we released a blog post from Hisomura on pen testing 101, getting in with social engineering. Again, all of that can be found on the INE.com website. So go check that out, scroll all the way to the bottom. You can see that there's a section there on blogs. Well, that brings us to today where I have a very special guest with us. So before I get to that, I just wanna say how, how thrilled I am to be able to bring everybody together today, especially present this great talk with honestly somebody who's a very old friend of mine. Philip and I have known each other for uh, over a decade, right, Phil? Um, and with that, we really only started to become good friends a few years ago. And I couldn't be happier that not only is, have we been able to do some projects in the past on the Ethical Hacker Network, but he's here with me today. And in fact, he's joined the INE family uh, as of last month. So both of us have covered this kind of topic in a whole bunch of different ways, but I'm thrilled to actually join forces and once again, be able to share the virtual stage with him today for starting a career as an ethical hacker. So before we bring in Phil, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, again, everybody, hi, I'm Don. Hi, Don. Um, <laughs> so I've been in the industry for quite some time. I come from a sysadmin background. And so I have a ton of experience not only being a sysadmin, but I was also a partner and a CTO in a software company. I was also a director of IT for the Department of Medicine of the largest medical school in the country. 
all of that, plus I have entrepreneurial blood running through my veins. Well, thanks mom and dad for that. I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse, but there it is. Also, that kind of led to the founding of the Ethical Hacker Network or ethicalhacker.net, which is a free online magazine and community for security professionals. Well, EHNet was acquired by eLearn Security, which was in turn acquired by INE. So I have always served as the editor in chief of the Ethical Hacker Network, as well as headed up all the community efforts for eLearn Security. But now my current role as director of community for INE, <clears throat> I'm gonna continue as an evangelist for cybersecurity career advancement, but hopefully I will be expanding my role and engaging a wider IT community to not just include cybersecurity, but also bring into the fold things like networking, cloud, data science, all those other topics that we do very well here at INE. And we'll be doing that a number of different ways from events, webinars like this, weeks that uh, celebrate all these different topics, the, you know, <laughs> the socials, Discord communities, I think you know the drill. Anyway, that's more than enough for, uh, about me. Philip, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Don. It's an honor to be joining. And as you mentioned, you know, we've been friends for a while. We originally met through EHNet. That was one of the first uh, websites that I used when I started my journey as a pen tester when I got started and did the, use the eLearn security content my second year as a pen tester. So this is really kind of cool to be part of this and be cool to be doing this webinar with you. We've done them before, but doing it as a coworker. So this is pretty great. Yeah, it's, it's amazing where life takes you and how these, you know, circles, uh, you know, you come full circle and the, the, the lines just intersect in, in very funny ways. And I just can't tell you how thrilled I am to be finally, as you mentioned, a coworker. But here on the screen, we see a little bit about you. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you're up to and what you might be doing with INE &E in your own words. Okay. Yeah, so for me, I got started a lot of similarities with you, Don. I started out as a system administrator. That's where I spent the first six years of my career. I got interested in security, moved into our security group at the uh, mortgage company I worked for, uh, did network security for about a year and a half, moved into application security. We The company hired... Uh, new CISO, he had a more uh, better idea of what a modern security organization looked like based on his experience. Prior to him coming aboard, we were all doing network security, firewalls, IDS, risk assessments, vulnerability scans, everyone's doing the same thing. And he kind of divided us up into different groups. And I got put in the AppSec group, which was pretty important in my pen testing career because there I got to use web application vulnerability scanners. I managed our third party pen test. So I found out about pen testing. And so when I got laid off from my job in 2012, I went to work consulting as a penetration tester. And so uh, along my journey, I spent the first five years of my pen testing career as a consultant. I was able to learn a lot during that time. I got out of consulting and went to work as an internal resource. And during that time, I started teaching at Dallas College. So I really, prior to teaching, I really had a passion for mentoring and helping others. I used to have people come to me for advice on how to get into pen testing and different certification advice. So I kind of did that over the years and then getting into teaching, starting the Pwn School Project, which is a meetup that I run that's more education based towards cybersecurity. I really seen that my role in life was more fit to be a coach, more to be a mentor and a teacher. That was more of my strengths. I've always been a competitive person coming from competitive powerlifting, I always wanted to be the best at whatever I could do, but I kind of learned that the coach and teacher thing is my, my strength. So coming and to work. Anyone, I who need... has, anyone who has met you for more than two minutes, that becomes <laughs> so clearly apparent. Um, and even though you can barely tell, you know, emotion or inflection in text mediums like social media, um, it also becomes very apparent if you follow Phil um, on Twitter or you're connected with him on LinkedIn. Um, he, he was born to do this. Sorry to interrupt. I just had to throw no that problem. in there. Yeah, thanks for, the, for adding that. But yeah, definitely. It's a place where I'm getting to share my passion, uh, getting to go, you know, when I was teaching at the college, you know, there's only like a certain level, entry level. While I really like helping people get started and I'll be working on that content for i &E, I'll get to work on some more advanced stuff as well. So this is a, really a great opportunity, you know, getting to work with uh, some of the content that I was using when I was first getting started. So it's a pleasure to be joining, and uh, I look forward to producing some new content for uh, I and E, and then updating and enhancing what we have in place already. I'm really excited because when you look at the merger or the acquisition 
of eLearn security, the quality of the product that IME has, the, all the effort and the quality they put into that, you know, we're going to take that, apply it to everything that's cybersecurity and bring up the quality of that there. So it's, uh, it's a win-win in my opinion. Awesome. Well, as we move into the presentation, every good presentation, or at least most of them, starts off with uh, doing some level setting. So let's do that with a few definitions. So first of all, what is hacking? <laughs> That's a, a very clear place to start. So have a few different definitions on your screen right now uh, through the ages, and then you'll kind of see how that morphs into what we are more familiar with today. So hacking can, as you know, take on a whole bunch of different meanings. That's kind of the way of the English language. But from way back in 1680, a hack was a negative term around doing subpar work in the hopes of financial gain. You'll also hear this in academic circles where people say, oh, that guy's a hack. Um, it, also, it can also mean to cut things into pieces. You know, take an ax and you hack it up. Now, it could also mean to manage or cope with a situation, or as we commonly use it, the negative of that, how not to cope. So people say, oh, he can't hack it. But then in the 1960s at MIT, uh, again, as I mentioned, started morphing into something a little more familiar to us today. So hacks were actually practical jokes that were performed on the students and faculty with a technical cleverness. It's also because of this that hacking became intimately connected to technology. So for that matter, anyone who could take apart computers or make them do things for which they were not originally meant to do or just be adept at using them, they became known as a hacker. Now, there was definitely mischief in those days, but when that mischief crossed the legal line, well, then the media started reporting on it. And of course, because it was sensational, that was the only thing that they ended up reporting on and so, unfortunately, those hackers became synonymous with criminal activities with a technical component. And so more often than not, when we hear, hear the word hacker today, it has that criminal uh, tinge to it, which honestly kind of makes the hair on the back of my neck stick up, and I really hate it. But being the eternal optimist, I often like to err on that side of the positive connotation of the word hacking, even though I do have to agree that several bad things are done with hacking skills, but like most endeavors in life, it's not necessarily the items or the tools themselves that are bad, it's the people and what they decide to do with them. So because of this connotation that everyone seems to know these days, we unfortunately had to come up with something else to differentiate between good and bad. So even though on Twitter I'm at Ethical Hacker, I, I founded an online magazine called the Ethical Hacker Network, believe it or not, I'm actually not that fond of the term ethical hacker, but that's the term that we have to use in order to be a little bit more descriptive. So when I tell people that I do ethical hacking or I'm, uh, I, I'm at ethical hacker, or all this stuff, they automatically think, hey, that's an oxymoron, isn't it? Because I'm used to hacking being something illegal. How can you do something that's ethical and illegal at the same time? Well, again, now knowing where those words come from and how we define those terms, well, we can basically break it down to saying, well, you know what? Ethical hacking is not an oxymoron. It's actually just a little bit more descriptive of where we fall on the side of hacking. So with that being said, you can basically break down the short version of the definition that ethical hacking is using the same tools and techniques as the bad guys to perform security related activities, but, and most importantly, with permission. So I'm not gonna get into all the different details of ethical hacking, but if you just think about it logically, if it could be anywhere where we could use the same tools and techniques as the bad guys, well, it's not just penetration testing, it could also be in areas like red teaming, forensics, incident response, development. Uh, you can break those down into things like exploit development, reverse engineering, but there's a lot of different disciplines that can utilize the hacking mindset, but for good. Well, with that, we're going to be focusing today on that first leg, which is penetration testing. And instead of getting into the, all, all the details with that, I'm going to bring in our good friend, Philip Wiley, and have him talk about basically how to, not only what pen testing is, but how to advance your career in it. But before we get to that, a little bit of maybe a public service announcement, Phil? Yeah, this is uh, this slide here. I would share this quote with my students each semester at the beginning of class. 
And my book was based off my talk, The Pentester Blueprint, which was originally the first day of class lecture that I gave to my students at the college where I teach. The other cybersecurity teachers would ask me to come in throughout the semester and give a talk to their students and tell them about penetration testing. But I like to share this each semester. It's a good uh, reminder to be careful when you're using these skills. And this quote I originally got from Spider-Man, Uncle Ben told Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. So as you learn these ethical hacking or these hacking skills, make sure you're using them with permission and using the right way. You don't want to get in trouble. If you're wanting to be a pen tester, work in security or IT or anything, if you get like a felony on your record, it's pretty hard to get a job. So make sure you got authorization, you're doing bug bounties, you know, make sure even better yet, you have written permission. So, you know, if you're doing pen testing, you know, use like a bug bounty platform uh, like Cobalt and Synac does like freelance and contract pen testing, work through someone like that, you know, get practice and try hack me and hack the box and those type of areas to hack or even a home lab, but be careful. And also that to be said, you see the little uh, logo up at the top of the screen, hacking is not a crime. I'm an advocate for an organization, organization that we're trying to get the word out that not all hacking is bad. As Don mentioned over the years, it's kind of got a negative connotation so part of this is, you know, uh, the organization started out, Brian Mackinich printed these stickers out and gave them out at DEF CON just trying to help support the hacking community. And he teamed up with Chloe Mistoggy, and she's a real advocate for uh, security researchers and hackers. So they're even talking to media, different uh, branches of government trying to help, you know, get back the original term of hacking and, and let people know it's not a bad thing. So what is pen testing? So pen testing is a form of hacking. Uh, and a lot of times us in the industry, we will say we're ethical hackers because it's easier to explain to an individual that compared to penetration testing or pen testing. So pen testing is assessing security from an adversarial perspective, attempting to exploit vulnerabilities to get unauthorized access to systems and sensitive data, also known as hacking. Yeah, and the interesting thing along with that, Phil, is that even the term hacking was so negative probably five or 10 years ago that you couldn't even say it in certain circles. So if you went to a major corporation or a government entity and said that you wanted to hack their systems, even though you meant the ethical hacking form of it, they, 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 they got scared and they couldn't hire anyone who did hacking. And so again, this is a way that we had to overcome that negative connotation. And so the industry as a whole started using terms like uh, security assessments, pen testing, and what have you. So kind of some of the reasons you perform a pen test is your security posture from an adversarial perspective gives you a better understanding of the risk severity. Exploitable vulnerabilities are higher risk and a higher priority for remediation as well as justification for budget. Uh, PCI compliance, different regulatory compliances are a lot of the reasons for pen testing. A lot of large financial institutions have their own pen test teams and, you know, back when I got started in 2012 as a pen tester, it was mainly consultants and contractors performing this work. But that kind of gets expensive when you have hundreds of applications that need to be tested. So more of these opportunities became, came in-house. It's a good opportunity with, with uh, great pay. And so as we kind of touched on the regulatory compliance, it's a fun job and there's a lot of opportunities in this field. So although it's not like a new job, it's becoming more more well-known, it's been uh, done, you know, required and part of the PCI, the payment card industry standard uh, is, you know, requirement for processing credit cards. So that's, unfortunately, you know, you wanna make sure you're testing for other reasons besides compliance. You wanna be secure first, but compliance has really driven a lot of the need for pen testing. And so there's some other areas that pen testing skills are helpful in. If you remember the screen Don showed earlier, some of those skills you're using ethical hacking. So if you're a SOC analyst, a digital forensics analyst, network analyst, uh, purple team or application security, these skills can be helpful. If you're a SOC analyst or a network engineer, be able to identify malicious traffic can be helpful. People that are you know, responding to an incident, investigating breaches, understanding the tools and how they work will make you better at your job. So it's good to know both sides of that. And even if you're a red team or, or a pen tester, knowing the defensive side is, is important as well. And so when you're performing a pen test, there's different items that get tested. So there's a need for a lot of these things. Some of these you may not be familiar with, but the more common ones are network. And this is from 
internal facing inside the company, external from the internet, and even wireless from outside. You know, your wireless and external are areas that need to be, be, needs to be checked and not overlooked because someone can, you know, from a mile down the road, hack into your facility through Wi-Fi if you're not secure. So these, these different areas need to be tested. Application, you know, most applications now are web-based. You still have some thick client applications that need to be tested. Uh, mobile and cloud as well in your API. Hardware, and not only network hardware, but your medical devices, insulin pumps and pacemakers, these could be hacked to cause harm to people. They could be breached. Uh, insulin pumps and pacemakers. Uh, I've done Wi-Fi pen tests for hospitals before. And you can see the medical devices connected onto that Wi-Fi network, which kind of puts it in perspective for you. Also performed a pen test for a company that was a manufacturer of medical devices and going through their uh, research and development area doing my pen test, I was able to seize devices. So that kind of brings into consideration what can happen. And so you may see some of these things like insulin pumps and pacemakers may not be Wi-Fi attached, but a lot of times they're using technologies like Bluetooth. So transportation with your self-driving autonomous vehicles, it's important we test these. And a lot of the automotive uh, companies are going through and, and doing pen tests against their products to make, care that, make sure they're safe. And so people in buildings, this gets more into your red team. Uh, your social engineering. So these are areas that need to be tested as well. You could have the best endpoint protection, everything really secure, but if someone can get physical access to that server, then you know they can get on the network a lot easier. And so how to become a pen tester. This is you know pretty much the reason for this talk and uh, the popular portion of it. So to become a pen tester, you need the technology knowledge. So you need to understand the knowledge, how to secure the knowledge before you can break into it via pen testing. So you need to understand networking, operating systems, especially Windows and Linux. Your enterprise environments are gonna rely heavily on Windows. A lot of your internet-based companies, uh, e-commerce, they use a lot of Linux. So you need to know both of these operating systems at a sysadmin level. You get a shell to that system, you wanna be able to navigate that system, perform different admin activities, and you know perform privilege escalation, you need to know the command line. So you need to understand the security and understand application hardware is a plus too. But the main things as a generalist you're wanting to focus on is network, operating systems, and security. That's the base knowledge you're going to need before you can start learning to pen test. And so how to become a pen tester. So you need to gain the hacking knowledge. So once you have that base knowledge coming in, uh, you need to learn how to hack. And this, this was where I was at when I started my career. I'd ran vulnerability scanners, I'd worked in application security, had been a sysadmin and all this, but I didn't know the hacking piece. So I started learning to hack. So this could be accomplished for different classes. They could be online in person, conferences, your, your different user group meetups and meetings, uh, self-study through home labs, videos, uh, tutorials, blogs, and articles. And Twitter is a good place to find these resources for these videos. There's a lot of great people to follow out there. There totally is. And just along with that, later we're going to share with you some of the conferences that we'll be attending this year. I know it's been very difficult uh, over the past year and figuring out which conference is actually still running, which ones are moving from physical to virtual. Um, so things are really starting to ramp up here uh, starting in March uh, for the entire industry when it comes to security conferences, hacker cons, um, and we're going to be participating in a whole bunch of them. So I'll share that with you in a little bit, but thought I'd just Give uh, Phil a little bit of a break to take a little sip there, and let's continue on. So also, when you're becoming a pen test, you need to, to you need the hacker mindset. So the hacker mindset is the ability to think like a hacker, be able to find ways to exploit vulnerabilities. And this mindset is the culmination of creative and analytical thinking. While there's a lot of different areas that require creative thinking, this is one of those areas in security that requires a lot of creative thinking. And developing this mindset is similar to troubleshooting. So you figure, you think about, you built your first Linux server, you got to connect the network, everything works fine. If something breaks, you got to learn how to troubleshoot it. And then as you learn how to troubleshoot different items, you're able to put that in your toolbox. And when you run into errors, errors building servers in the future, adding servers to your environment, then that comes more natural. So learning the different hacking tools, if you see that a website is vulnerable to uh, unrestricted uploads, you can upload malicious files to it, then you learn, okay, I get access. I've got a shell to the system, what I do next? You know, you get to elevate your privileges if you're not running at a high level access, 
if the web server is running as just a typical user, you have to elevate your privileges. If it's running NT system authority or root, then you can do a lot of things. So you kind of learn what signs to look for as you make your initial foothold, different exploits that work. So you kind of build this and that develops the mindset of a hacker. And the best way to develop this is through repetition and it's best developed by hands-on experience. So not only learning, but practicing what you're learning in a lab, learning how to hack, that's what's gonna help ingrain these skills that you're, you're learning. Another good one to point out is just flat out curiosity. You know, if you're the type of person, like as a kid, you used to take things apart and figure out how did they work and maybe even put them back together in a slightly different way to make them a little better, maybe you modded it in some way or whatever. I know a lot of kids do that today with video games where they're modding it in order to get either extra capabilities or extended life, or they can't take damage. All of these things kind of fall into that hacker mindset. But one other thing to add to this, if you don't mind, Phil, sure. is that you also have to be a lifelong learner. You have to understand that there's always new technology coming out. There's always new protocols and the adversaries, they're always upping their game. We always talk about this uh, you know, ever or never ending arms race between the bad guys are getting a little better so then we have to lift our game. And hopefully we lift it up a little bit more than they do so that way we can prevent some things in the near future but then they again come around with things that uh, can take advantage of what we just put into place. So being a lifelong learner is something that in essence becomes a prerequisite for this type of thing. But you're gonna figure that out pretty quickly. But anyway, thanks for letting me uh, uh, throw that in there. But just to throw this in here, again, that pen tester blueprint formula, keep in mind that what you're witnessing here today is just a mini version of not only a talk that Philip has given numerous times across the entire industry, but it also goes hand in hand with the book that he wrote with the same title, The Pen Tester Blueprint. So he's a co-author of that. So please go check out that book um, while we had that little Moment of break, I'll give it back to Phil. Yeah, thanks for that. Those are, those are great inputs. And when you mentioned the curiosity, when I was a kid, my dad used to take apart my mechanical toys and, and I got used to taking things apart. So it got me interested in, in taking things apart or reverse, in, reverse engineering thing. And great points on the being a lifelong learner. When I worked as a sysadmin, you know, I really only had to focus on the Windows and Linux realm. I didn't have to focus on a lot of these other areas. And as a pen tester or security practitioner, you need to constantly keep up with that. So those are, are, are really good points. And uh, as mentioned here, the pen tester blueprint, the technology knowledge plus the security knowledge plus the hacker mindset is what you need. And the technology and the building piece, my first consulting job as a pen tester, our manager used to always encourage us to build stuff. He never encouraged us to take pen testing classes he told us to build something because if you learn how to build an application, you're going to know how things work. I know from my experience, a lot of the things I did before I became a pen tester is I taught myself web design. So I had actually hosted my clients' websites at home. I had a server running Apache web server on Red Hat Linux and I would host it all there. So I taught myself how to use Apache web server by building that whenever I do a pen test, I remember how that's installed and I can go back and look and see this is a directory that's interesting. Look at these are areas that need to be secured. So understanding that and reading manuals, some of the best pen testers I know will read the manuals. They're working on a, a pen test. They run across a new technology. They're reading the manuals to learn. So this is one of the things you've got to understand. It's not just about the hacking, understanding the technology and the security of the technologies is going to make it possible for you to break in. It's going to make your life a lot easier understanding that and make you more successful. So where do you start? So you need to develop a plan. So you're, what you're going to do is you're going to do a, a gap analysis on the skills you have and the skills needed. And so we mentioned you need the technology knowledge and the security knowledge. So you're going to look at and the, the hacking skills. So you're going to look at what you got there. So a lot of you probably joining us probably work in IT. Some people are trying to get in. So if you have no IT experience at all, you want to start with the basics. So there's no shortcuts to becoming a hacker or pen tester. You've got to learn the basics. And the, and the more time you take and effort you put into learning those, the more successful you're going to be. So no IT experience. You need to learn operating systems, hardware, and networking. If you got IT experience, you know, there's a lot of areas in IT you may not work with Linux. So learn Linux, security, and networking. 
if you got infosec experience, fill in the gaps and those things you're missing out on. A lot of cases, people here are going to be missing out on the hacking portion of the pen testing skills. So like CTFs, hack the box, uh, bug bounties, these are great ways to build a hacking experience. And no matter what level you're at, build a home lab. Even someone that's been you know in the industry as long as I have, I still have a home lab that I test my proof of concepts and test new hacks that I've learned. Yeah, and that goes back to what Phil was saying before, where in his previous job, they recommended that he build it, or he started to learn, you know, web development so he could understand the inner workings of it. So you don't necessarily have to have that as a job in order to get practical hands-on experience with this stuff. So not only with things like he mentioned there, and also, you know, try Hack Me, as well as all the courses we offer with INE and the certifications through eLearn Security. Well, all of those things are kind of already pre-set up for you. And so you don't really get the understanding of what it took to build it and what the underlying technology is that you are required to attack. And so by building your own lab, you get that intimate experience without necessarily messing with any production systems. So it's great. Uh, building your own home lab is not only great to practice whenever and however you want, but the actual process of building it is a huge uh, educational benefit to you. Yeah, and just knowing how to build that infrastructure because if you're, you know, you're working on a pen test team or red team, there's times that you need to have you need to host, you know, some sort sort of infrastructure in the cloud. So if you know how to build servers, you're able to set up that testing infrastructure. So kind of back on topic to the lab environment. So I've got like three general categories here. These are not, you know, set in stone. This could be as complicated or as easy as you want them to be. The minimalist lab. This is just whatever your computer that you're using. Uh, you install like some type of virtualization software like VirtualBox, VMware, or Microsoft Hypervisor, and then you download some vulnerable VMs. And then you have like your Kali Linux attack platform or, or uh, Parrot OS running on there. And so your dedicated lab, you may have separate systems. And so you, you can actually go across the network to attack systems. So I have a minimalist lab set up at home and a dedicated lab. So my, my MacBook Pro, I've got, you know, VirtualBox and VMware both on there. And I uh, also have a server that does nothing but host vulnerable VMs. And so I got that to, to work on as well. And your advanced labs, you can build, you can have individual components. Some people go out and buy servers and individual workstations. You can do a lot of stuff with a Raspberry Pi. You can take a Raspberry Pi, build your servers on there, web servers. You can even, you know, you can use your own routers and switches, but you can also take Raspberry Pis to build, build your own routers and switches. So you can get as, as you know, complex as you want to, but one of the things to keep in mind when you're building this, if there's like a certain piece of this education you know, journey that you need to work on, if you need more of the hacking stuff, then make sure that uh, you don't get too caught up and have a troubleshoot and work on your lab. So your home attack platform Kali Linux, most people have heard of, and I've, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, whenever I went through the through some of my certifications, I started out with Backtrack and then moved into Kali Linux, but Parrot OS has been a good one. I used that last year. I was doing some Wi-Fi pen testing for my employer. Some of the tools weren't working on Kali Linux, some of the deprecation of Python 2.7, some of the tools weren't working right, so I used Parrot OS, and I'm a, actually a big fan of it now. If I can't get something to work on Kali Linux, I use Parrot. And so you can use like Ubuntu with the pen tester framework, which is a set of scripts that you can install your pen testing tools on there, as well as uh, Commando VM by FireEye. You can install that on Windows 10. And as far as like pen testing, you want to use both platforms. Understand how to use the hacking tools on Windows and Linux both, because there's some good system administrator tools and Active Directory administrator tools on Windows that work really great that are good to have in your tool set. So you need something to attack. So you need some vulnerable VMs. And some of these you can find from Vulnhub. Uh, Metasploitable 2 and 3 are really great resources to start out with. Metasploitable 2 runs on Ubuntu. And Metasploitable 3 you can actually set up on Windows. So you want to practice hacking Windows and Linux both. And the good thing about the Metasploitable VMs, they've got a lot of vulnerabilities on there to hack. So this could be multiple VMs. So this gives you a lot of uh, stuff to work with starting out. And there's a lot of vulnerable apps. WebGoat is just an example. You have Juice Shop. If you go to the OWASP website, you can find a lot of different vulnerable apps that you can download, install, vulnerable VMs, as well as some cloud-based vulnerable apps that you can test against. 
And then you can create your own targets. So you can go out to exploit DB and download some default vulnerable software that you see out there. Not only does, does exploit DB host the, the exploits, they actually have links to the vulnerable software. So you can test that on. And some, re some recommended reading here, whenever I started my uh, pen testing class at Dallas College, I started out with Georgia Weedman's book, Penetration Testing, a hands-on introduction to hacking. This is a good one to start with because it takes you through building your own lab. So you can build your own lab as well as learning how to pen test. The second book I recommend is the, the Hacker's Playbook 2 and 3. I wouldn't skip over version 3 because version of, over version 2, but version 3 gets more to red teaming. So you want to kind of go in that order. Web Application Hacker's Handbook, Discovering and Exploiting Security Flaws is a really great book for web app pen testing. The Operator Handbook and the Red Team Field Manual has some really great resources on different command lines, how to use different tools, even like Docker and some of that stuff. So it's like a really quick reference. It's good for red teamers as well as blue teamers. And of course, knowing the type of guy that Phil is, you can even notice that on his own slide, he doesn't even promote his own book. That just happens to be how he is. So I'll plug it for him. Uh, please go check out uh, the Pentester Blueprint. It's a fantastic, uh, more extensive version of what you're finding in this talk. And just to kind of, to, to kind of uh, add to that, if, you know, one thing is that Pentester Blueprint is not, it's not going to teach you the pen testing. It's going to show you the resources. It's going to show you what you need to learn, the different certifications and things. So I just don't want anyone to go out and buy the book expecting this is going to be a, the end all be all book. You know, it lists different resources and things that you need. But if you, you know, want a more detailed roadmap of how to become a pen tester, then it is a great resource. And while we're giving uh, kudos where they are deserved, do you want to give a little shout out to your co-author? Yes, Kimberly Crawley. Uh, one of the lessons I learned when I was writing the Pen Tester Blueprint is to help others for help, you know, at, reach out to others for help. Because when I was writing the book, I had a lot of other things going on and just wasn't getting the content, the, the, you know, filling the book the way I needed. And so I was either going to do self-publish or I had a contract with Wiley Publishing. Since I said I had the contract, I was going to do this. I wanted to complete what I was working on. So I ruled out the self-publishing and then I, you know, you know, knew Kim from the industry and I thought she'd be a great one because she's got some experience in the industry as well as she's a, a great writer. So uh, I had Kim join me on that and she brought a lot of good uh, resources there. She did interviews with different people on building home labs, how they got started and how you can use different jobs, job skills as a pen tester, how that could help you out. So she really took a concept and made, made it a lot better. So uh, kudos to, and, and thanks to her for helping out with that. Excellent. Well, thanks for that little shout out. If you don't mind, I'm going to rush through the next few slides so we can sure. get to that Q and a section uh, that we've been telling everybody that we definitely want to dedicate more time to. Um, so we can always come back to this resource list, but here's just a smattering of things that Phil put together as well as myself uh, for some areas where you can really start to hone your skills. And of course, obviously at the bottom, yeah, Marketing makes the world go round, so please forgive us for being a, a, a little bit salesy, although most of this hopefully is fully dedicated or mostly dedicated to helping you with your career. But there's always the resources that are provided through INE in order to prepare you for the certifications on eLearn security. And along those same lines, oh, go ahead. And add to that too, the INE content, eLearn security, I mentioned that in my book and that was before I ever became an employer. I mean, these were my recommendations so people that wanted to go for the OSCP certification, my recommended path was the EJPT and the, uh, the ECP, ECPTP uh, certification. So that was my recommended path. So these were resources I used to recommend. And when I recommend stuff, I usually will actually get the training myself or I've been through it and check it out. I just don't you know, recommend resources without verifying them first. Awesome. Well, you don't have to take our word for it. <laughs> so not only Phil before he came and worked with us, but also go check out uh, things like our special guest today, Joe Helley. And there's plenty of other influencers out there like John Hammond and Network Chuck and the Cyber Mentor. Plenty of people have some great things to say about INE and eLearn security. Um, so go check those out. Um, but proof is in the pudding. So honestly, go try it for yourself. And you can actually do that with the INE Starter Pass, which is 100% free. And, and I'm, I mean free. And that's not just a special offer. It's not a coupon code or anything. This, this is free for everybody uh, for 
uh, for the foreseeable future. I'll just put it that way. Never say never, but there you go. But this gives you full access to numerous snippets of all of the content that INE provides in courses like cybersecurity, networking, cloud, data science, and more, as we mentioned before. But and here's the kicker. It also includes an entire full introductory security learning path that we call the Penetration Testing Student Learning Path, or PTS, if you're used to that, when it was on the eLearn security side. But now that entire course, so I mean everything, the slide decks, the videos, the hands-on virtual labs, even the three black box practice pen tests are all included with unlimited lab time, absolutely free. I'll, I'll say it again, it's absolutely free. So go ahead on over to INE.com, give it a try. You've got nothing to lose and honestly, a life-changing career move to gain. All right, so we wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Um, if you wanna contact us, here's, our, here's how you can find us on Twitter. So I'm at Ethical Hacker, clearly there's Philip Wiley, INE and eLearn Security, as well as our special guest today, at Joe Helly. And as I mentioned, we will be hitting the circuit this year as well. So not only will we be at a number of different individual events, but we are again, season sponsors for the IoT Village. So it's looking like the IoT Village is probably gonna have upwards of about 15 to 20 different events that they will be attending and having their, their wares on display um, throughout 2021. And we're gonna be at every single one of them. And a lot of people think, well, wait a minute, how am I going to do hands-on hacking uh, with IoT devices when everything's virtual? Well, they've actually virtualized it. And so even though you're not going to get some experience with soldering or connecting the probes to the board and dumping the firmware, you will get hands-on labs at the IoT Villages. So go check us out there. We're also proud to announce that we are Diamond Sponsors of the Diane Initiative. We are a partner with, uh, with Ben and doing the HomCon. And we'll be at a number of different large events, small events, DEF CON, hopefully in person. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but you can definitely join us in all those different venues. All right. So with that, we're going to get into Q&A. I know a lot of you are also attending today to figure out those prizes. But stick with us till the end. We, uh, we will pick our winners uh, in a random fashion and give away some really cool prizes. But with that, I want to welcome our special guest today, Joe Helley. He's better known as the mayor. Uh, Joe, welcome. We can see your screen here. Maybe you can tell us uh, very briefly a little bit about yourself, and then we'll get into questions for everybody. Sure. Thank you so much for having me, um, Phil and Don and the INE team. Uh, Joe Helley, I'm the mayor. I stream on Twitch, and I've got a decent Twitter following. Uh, I'm a former mayor. I was in the Army for nearly seven years, and I'm a, a security engineer doing penetration tests. Even today, as a matter of fact, sitting here on my other screen, I'm I'm chugging away at once. So uh, we... Uh, we'll hit some of the Q&A uh, as Don uh, permits here in a moment, but uh, working with folks like Philip and some other people, uh, some of us are forward thinking and we start thinking about how we can better improve uh, the field for those who come after us. And I'm a huge advocate uh, for making sure that when we get our feet in the door, we don't lock it behind us. And that's kind of what we've seen for so long uh, is as soon as you've gotten in, you know, you know, a lot of people know, you know, no longer care about what's coming after them. So uh, folks like me, folks like Philip, folks like Don, and a lot of other people are really interested in improving the field. Uh, and that's kind of where my passion lies outside of the uh, nine to five portion of things. So again, thank you so much for having me and uh, I'd love to answer some questions if we can. Absolutely. We all stand on the shoulders of giants. There are people in, in my life that helped me out. And um, you're going to find uh, if you're new to this area, not only is it kind of ingrained into the IT community to help each other out, but even more so when you get specifically into cybersecurity. So paying it forward is a huge thing in our community. And I'm thrilled to be a part, part of that community with all of these fine gentlemen. All right, let's get to the questions. So um, maybe I'll take this one a little bit, but then I'll ask you guys because you actually have experience doing these things and applying it to your careers um, outside of the eLearn Security i &E mindset. So I'm sure I'm going to be a little biased in my answers, uh, but here we go. So the first one is, can I get a job as a junior pen tester on the basis of just the EJPT certification and having maybe some experience on something like Try Hack Me or another platform of the type? My short answer, yes. Longer answer, it's a little more nuanced than that. Your mileage may vary. It depends on how much experience you come 
uh, come to the table with from an IT perspective. If you come with no security experience, well, try Hack Me is a fantastic way to get extra hands-on experience, but then also do things like we often talk about in a number of our webinars on overcoming that catch-22. And what I mean by that is that vicious cycle of I don't have experience. If I don't have experience, how can I get the job? And if I can't get the job, well, then how do I get experience? And it's this vicious cycle. How do I break that and get on the inside and start advancing my career? Well, there's a ton of ways to do that as well. So if you can do things like volunteer for events, if you, you know, write some blogs, do a stream, attend events, um, you know, volunteer for a nonprofit organization, volunteer for an open source project. There are all kinds of ways where the barriers to entry are much lower and therefore you can not only get practical experience, but now you get some awesome things to throw on your res resume. And don't forget CTFs because that's important too, because not only can you learn a lot from a CTF, you might just win some prizes, but all those little things are actually very important and I highly recommend you include those on your resume. So if you have some of those things to go along with the EJPT search, it definitely makes it easier to overcome uh, you know, that HR filter and get your foot in the door. Um, but of, of course, your bios may vary. So why don't we throw this one to Phil? Phil, what do you think about the penetration testing student course that prepares you for the EJPT or the eLearn Security Junior Penetration Tester exam and how that bodes well for getting your foot in the door? Yeah, and a lot of this is gonna depend on, you know, taking advantage of the situation, of the opportunities you have and doing the best to learn. One of the things I'd like want to share with everyone too is no matter you're working on certifications, make sure you're learning along the way. Don't just do what you need to do to get past the cert, get the cert, be done with it. You know, as Don mentioned earlier, you got to be a lifelong learner. You can get in. I've seen people get in the industry without, without a cert at all. But what the thing that's going to help you the most if you get that interview is the experience you've got doing like the black box pen, black box pen test during that course is being able to describe the tools, the techniques and how to perform a pen test. So you get the interview, be able to answer those questions in the interview is what's gonna help you. So what you learn, the, the uh, certs are gonna get your foot in the door, but understanding you know, what you learn is what's gonna help get, the, get you the job. I've seen a lot of people without certs at all. And uh, I'm a firm believer in some certs, so that definitely thinks it help, helps getting started out. But, uh, you know, yeah, it could get your foot in the door. Definitely, if you, as long as you understand it. There's people, a lot of people getting their foot in the door too with like doing bug bounties. And so what you're learning through that, just like this, like practicing in your home labs, learning how to hack, uh, doing pen tests and like lab environments and that sort of thing, you know, that pre prepares you for the interview. There's yeah. nothing wrong with making a little extra cash on the side by doing some bug bounties. Yeah. Um, great way to, to learn, make some money, and do the things that you have to do so that way eventually you can do the things that you want to do. But something that Philip brought up is probably a good transition into a question for you, Joe, because he said, you know what, it's not just getting that certification and checking that box that HR is looking for, but it's also, okay, great. That may help you get the interview, but then how do you perform on that interview? So you want to make sure that you are practicing things and doing training that actually mimics what you might do on the job and definitely prepare you for that technical portion of the job interview. Could you address that a little bit for me? Sure. Um, and back to just briefly about uh, the, the previous question as well, and then I'll jump right into uh, preparation. Um, being somebody who's been in this industry basically exactly one year, I started with the EJPT. That's where I started my penetration testing career. Uh, I had Security Plus, I had A Plus and Net Plus from college and SSCP from ISC Squared, but I wasn't getting a job. And it just, you know, I didn't have that help desk experience. So I started looking for ways that I could apply uh, additional skills and learning to perform and succeed. So I jumped into the EJPT got that certificate and looked at the ECPPT. And this will answer both questions as we go, Don. Uh, and I started just going at it as hard as I could, uh, learning as much as I could along the way and failing at every step to find work. Every step. Um, if you all know the Cyber Mentor, he was um, amazing. He offered me uh, an internship to work with him, get some foot in the door experience. But even with that, I wasn't getting anywhere. I, I wasn't getting interviews. I wasn't getting hired. What got my foot in the door was making it so I could no longer be ignored by HR. I side-doored that HR process by networking. 
I took all of those skills and I started showing them off to as many people as I could. I started streaming. I started a Twitter. I started a blog. I started a GitHub. I have a Discord. All of these different pieces put together is what made me stand apart. Because if we all have the same certifications, if there's no diversity in, in who we are on the application, if we all look the same with all of those resume bullets, all that training, then we don't look different. And then we have to start looking for ways to stand apart even more. And, and that's what I did. And, and there's a plethora of ways to do it. The local security groups, B-sides, uh, volunteering to, uh, to volunteer at, at, at an event or a conference or even speak at one. But the more you're able to make yourself not be ignored, the better chances you're going to have, in my opinion. And the way you do that is by building that knowledge base. I started with EJPT. I went to ECPBT. I became a well-rounded pen tester early on rather than you know, some, some other paths, uh, I, I took what I thought was the best path forward. My career is where it's at today because of those courses. Um, I've been a firm, anybody who knows me knows that I, I tout eLearn and I and E uh, over top the other companies because I believe in it. Uh, and it's those skills that I've been able to apply to actually succeed. So uh, hopefully that answers your question a bit, Don. Um, and to answer that original question, being as I'm right there in, in the thick with you guys trying to find work at one point here in the, in the during a pandemic, which was even worse. Uh, but it was making myself not be able to be ignored anymore and, and just taking the initiative to be seen. And, and now you're doing it. So let me piggyback on that with a follow up sure. question. I mean, <laughs> while we were going through, you know, our, our prep before we went live today, uh, you're actually performing a pen test. I so am. you are in the field now and you're working. And in fact, because of the, uh, uh, not only the skill that you have, but differentiating yourself from other candidates, now people are starting to find you and try and steal you away or offer you jobs or offer you side gigs. Um, how does that feel knowing where you were a year ago? Um, well, anybody who knows me knows that I try to remain humble, right? Uh, as, you, as, as you said uh, a few minutes ago, we all ride shoulders to get where we're at. Nobody in this field is self-made. It's, it's impossible. You've, you've read a Philip Wiley book. You've read the, you know, the web app pen testers playbook. You, you've used, you know, certifications. You've used TriHackMe or Hack the Box or you've watched IPSEC or any of these different options. Um, great shout so, out. IPSEC does great stuff. So to be um, wanted and valued based on the value I provide to hopefully the industry that people are able to identify, it's huge. Uh, you know, it, it makes you grin, it makes you smile, it makes you happy, but you want to remain humble too, in, in my opinion. And it's just the way I kind of am. Um, it, it's great to brag a little bit with, you know, close friends, you know, share those successes privately and help other people succeed publicly is kind of how I look at it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm over here on this monitor behind me, the window is minimized. I, I, I have Burt Pro over here running right now. Um, beating up a web application. So um, <laughs> for good pay, <laughs> for, for pretty good pay. But, um, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's been a year of hard work, sometimes misery. I had to give up a lot of time with my friends and my family, uh, late hours, early days. So, you know, it does come with a cost, but um, in the end, it, it's very humbling to, um, you know, be professionally wanted or desired, so to speak, uh, and to have those skills in high demand. But the, uh, the, the lifestyle now that you can lead, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, you become an ethical hacker and you'll become a millionaire. That's, that's not what we're trying to do here. But the quality of life is definitely something that a lot of people recognize, because once you get into this, you are going to be making a much better salary than where you were, because not only are these skills highly technical, they're in high demand. And because they're in high demand, and as I like to say, <laughs> cybersecurity waits for no virus. Um, if anything, it there became more of a need for cybersecurity professionals during this entire last year dealing with COVID. Um, so you know, uh, uh, you know, de uh, demand of these security professionals is just skyrocketing, and therefore the, the the price to hire them actually goes up. So maybe Phil, you can talk about that um, a little bit as to. Maybe how changing into this career changed your life. Yeah, changing this career, how it changed my life is the topic itself I'm really passionate about. I love going to conferences and meetups. I mean, it's it's my hobby. You know, that's what I do for fun, go to conferences and and that sort of thing. So it's I've met a lot of 
people and it's a more clo close knit community than, you know, I compete in powerlifting for years and like the fitness community wasn't this tight knit. So the friends I've made through the industry and has just been a lot better. You know, it's, it's been a lot more rewarding and, and beneficial to me. So that's really kind of how it's changed my life. I mean, it's, you know, before it was spending the weekends going to powerlifting competitions, whether it's competing or not, or going to fitness expos. And now it's, if there's a security conference, a big security conference, I want to go to, if there's something local, I'll be there. So that's kind of how it's changed my life. Our wrestling bears. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can get into that later i don't know if you if, uh, the audience saw a picture of that when we were sharing the twitter handles but that is phil literally wrestling a real bear so i don't know buy buy him a beer or a coffee or something like that eventually when we meet up uh, but just to let everybody know we have a few minutes before the top of the hour we're going to continue taking some questions i'm going to break in just a minute to announce who the winners are of the prizes and then we're gonna wrap things up today so that way we can stop the recording of the video and kind of put a bow on this presentation at around the hour mark. But then everybody here has agreed to stay a little longer. So if you wanna stay along with us, we will give you at least an extra half an hour to answer a ton of questions about career certifications, training, uh, all kinds of cool stuff. All right, so with that, here's one for you, Phil. What is the difference between the hacker mindset and the troubleshooting mindset, are there any critical differences? I guess the critical thinking part is kind of in common, but troubleshooting, you're just trying to get something to work. Whereas with the hacker mindset, you're trying to get things to work in ways they shouldn't. That's the main difference there. I mean, it's more, yeah, I guess that's uh, the best description for it. I mean, critical thinking on both, but the hacker mindset, you know, it's, and when you're troubleshooting, there's a lot more resources on how to do a certain type of troubleshooting. You know, people that find O-Days just have to kind of figure that out on their own. It's something that didn't exist on, on how to actually exploit that. Yeah, and I would, I would piggyback on that as well and say that that is true. But also you have to think about it. Usually when you're troubleshooting, you're solving for one problem. And once you solve that problem, okay, you're done. The hacker mindset never stops at the first thing that you find. <laughs> yeah. In fact, you will keep going to find things that nobody even imagined could even possibly be found. Not only I have that, one over here right now. <laughs> <laughs> we, we talked about that earlier. I have uh, one on the screen over here right now. Why don't you share that story? It's pretty cool. I mean, it, what you can in a very generic sense, because that is a paying client, and we don't want to divulge any information, but just the concept of what you found. Uh, yeah, it's um, sometimes you're not going to find everything manually. And um, we'll just wrap into kind of a plug for I&E. &E. I, I think that it's amazing that the organization, when you take tests, allows you to uh, apply your skills the way you best see fit when you do your exam, whether it's manual exploitation, using automated tools, et cetera. Um, I'm running a, a tool called NetSparker. It's uh, like a Burt Pro on steroids, so to speak. And it's, it's found some really interesting uh, local file inclusions that I can't figure out how it actually works. Uh, but they're there. I'm, I'm able to read the file system. I'm able to look at things. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about troubleshooting and researching. I sat for an hour and a half trying to figure this thing out. And, and I'm still working on it because I want to provide the client with the most information that I can uh, when it comes to trying to remediate this issue. Because in the end, we're not just here to break stuff. That, that's the fun part. Uh, but we also want to provide uh, the improvement, the security that the client deserves as well. So uh, we can, you know, fire and forget all day. We can do the Armitage Hail Mary, so to speak, and we can just, uh, you know, nail the client with everything that we can. But in the end, we want to provide them quality and value as well. And that includes securing their environments. So if you run a scanner and, you, you know, you get a finding and you know it's there, but you can't confirm it, uh, you need to dig in as much as you can, even if it you know, the remediation is have your web developers look at this. We weren't able to find the, the reason it's happening. Um, but that goes back to that troubleshooting. And, and, you know, the hacker mindset, as you're calling it, um, I think of it very much as a research mindset as well. We spend an awful lot of our time researching, Googling, GitHub, reading trade books. Uh, you know, if you have a Cisco router that you're looking for an exploit on, looking at, you know, the CV website, looking at exploit DB, a lot of what we do is research based. I call myself a researcher half the time uh, because I'm plugging away, you know, looking through links, trying to find solutions to issues that I'm looking at um, and a lot less time hacking stuff. So, uh, you know, it, it's a very, very, very diverse field 
uh, with a lot of moving parts all the time. And that's what I love about it. I like to tinker. You, you were talking about that on the early part of the hour. You have to like to tinker with things. I love tinkering and just, you know, doing that kind of activity. So, but yeah, it, it's the coolest thing. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> I can't figure yeah. it out. And, and the fun thing is, is that you could always, uh, you know, hack other things. People often think of hacking, you know, from just a security standpoint, but you can hack your car, you can hack your toaster. There's all kinds of things that you can hack. And really, it's just getting into that, uh, that idea that you just want to tinker with it. But I want to expand a little bit on something that you mentioned, Joe, whereas the certification exams that are offered through eLearn Security, and you take the IE training in order to prepare for those exams, they quite literally mimic exactly what you will do for the job. That's why they end up becoming so well known, so popular, and why we have just so many testimonials that talk about not only did it, you know, help me in the technical portion of the job interview, but I got offered the job on the spot because I could show I could do exactly what the job required. And so as an example, with the EJPT, granted it's a multiple choice exam, but you actually have to log into a virtual environment and you have to do a pen test on that network. So the answers to those multiple choice questions come from you performing a real pen test. Now, granted, that's a junior pen tester role. And so because of that, you're not expected to know everything. You're not expected to be the one that communicates with the client. But once you bump up from pen testing student to pen testing professional, that's the training path on the INE platform. Well, now you're gonna be expected to know a lot more but also the exam that you prepare for, which is the eLearn Security CP, it's actually the C ECPPT, which is the eLearn Security Professional Pen Testing Certification, um, that even more mimics a real life pen test. Oh, you absolutely. are given a letter of engagement, you're given credentials to a VPN environment, you log into that environment, and you are to perform a pen test. There's no multiple choice questions. You are required to take notes all along the way and actually write your own report just as you would in the real world and hand that to your manager or your client. And that report for the exam is judged by a human. In addition to that, it's an open environment when you log into that VPN environment. There are no restrictions. We're not saying you have to use these manual tools or you have to use Burp Suite or you have to use Metasploit or you have to use anything else you can use whatever you want. If you wanna script your own uh, network mapper, instead of using Nmap, if you wanna do something in Python, knock yourself out. If you wanna automate the process so it's faster for you, however you wanna do it, because that's exactly what is required of you when you do the real job. We don't necessarily care how you do it. Are you doing it thoroughly? Are you doing it effectively? And in the end, are you communicating what you found and how to fix it with the client? So with that, let me take a break uh, for just a moment, gentlemen. That's probably a great transition into our giveaways. Can I just add one more thing really quick? Yeah, go for it. Because I, I got to go to, I got to pick my kids up. Um, talking about tools, I did the WAPT recently, the Web App Penetration Tester course. I did it both with Burp Suite Pro and using OWASP Zap. I ran through it first with Burp Suite Pro uh, because there's a lot of communication and conversation in the industry with different certification companies. Uh, about unfair playing fields, right? Is, is it unfair if somebody uses Burp Suite Pro versus somebody who has Burp Community or uses a Watt Zap? And I can tell you, I got the same results and even better results using Zap on the exam uh, environment than I did with Burp Suite Pro. Um, so there's something to be said about tools, making sure that you double check your, you know, your, your equipment as well as I was a paratrooper. So you want to double check your equipment before you head out the door. Um, but know that that argument to me is nuanced and it's, uh, I know somebody who's used Cobalt Strike on the on the PTP exam, and there I was chugging away with with Metasploit. So uh, there's a lot of different ways to achieve your goal, and I can tell you there's no difference in the playing field and how it's level or not, uh, how you do it. So, uh, but guys, I do have to take off. I do appreciate you guys having me here. I got to pick my kiddo up from school. Um, so Philip and Don, thank you so much, and everybody else out there in the uh, in the chat, thank you guys so much for being here and for asking some questions. No thanks problem. Thanks, us. Joe. We appreciate the uh, the inspiration and the feedback. Phil? Yeah, thanks for joining us, Joe. Yep. Take care, guys. See ya. All right. So let's go back and let's give some stuff away. Let me find the slide. There we go. 
All right. Well, as mentioned all week, um, by registering for these uh, webinars, as well as attending, you've been automatically entered into a drawing for some great prizes from INE and eLearn Security. Now, the top prize is our full year of our premium subscription, we're $750. And you'll probably notice if you are a fan of eLearn Security and INE from the past. So basically what you used to get with the cybersecurity pass for $2,000 a year, just recently, in fact, earlier this month, we drastically reduced that price. And so now instead of $2,000 a month, it's only $750 a month. But not only does it include every single course that used to be on the eLearn Security platform that is now on the INE platform, and you also get unlimited lab time with that. But in addition to that, now for that $749 for that premium subscription to the INE platform, you get access to every single course that INE offers. So that's everything, cybersecurity and all the labs. That's uh, in, in fact, all of the networking stuff, the cloud courses, the data science materials. But in addition to that, you also get discounts on eLearn security certifications. You get free access to special boot camps, several day trainings that we offer for free. So it's a humongous value. We are thrilled to be able to announce that not only the price drop, but what you're getting for it, but it drastically lowers the bar and the barrier for people to not only get um, excellent training for the career of their choice, but at a fantastic price. Now, if you don't feel like you either need those labs or you've created your own labs or you wanna try somebody else's labs, hey, no problem. Ours are definitely geared and matched with the courses that we offer, so it's very convenient for you. But we also have other things like the monthly plan. So for the monthly plan, you can get access to all the content that INE has to offer for only $49 a month. Now, granted, that does not include the labs, but that includes a huge amount of content that no one in their right mind could ever go through in, in even two or three years. If you want a little bit better deal, we can go with the annual deal at $4.99. Again, gives you access to everything, but for only 250 bucks more, now you get access to unlimited lab time. So it's a fantastic deal. We're happy to be able to offer that to one lucky winner today. In addition to that, the second prize will be a $400 eLearn Security exam voucher for the exam of your choice. Just so everyone knows, almost every single exam that eLearn Security provides costs $400, except for EJPT. Again, we wanna lower that barrier to getting you into this field and making good money and having the career of your dreams. And so that eLearn Security EJPT exam is only $200. So that's our third prize for today. It's a $200 eLearn Security exam voucher, which you can either use for that entire EJPT certification voucher, or you can use it towards one of the others. Either way, some great things to give away. We thank everyone for attending Cybersecurity Week, um, and registering, joining us for all the activities that we have. So without further ado, let's start at the bottom with a third place prize. So that $200 eLearn Security exam voucher, um, has been chosen by our guru of social media, Emma. So thanks for handling that for us, Emma, and everything else uh, in the background for not only putting together Cybersecurity Week, but also helping in promoting it, getting everything prepared. You are indispensable. So thank you so much for everything that you do. So Emma has randomly chosen the three winners. And the first winner is Carol M. And that's with, uh, Carol is spelled K-A-R-O-L. So probably the Polish version of that. And the last initial is M as in Mary. Now we have your contact information. So you and the other two winners don't have to do anything. We will contact you as and exactly give you those instructions on how to uh, get your prize. Oh, and of course my phone went on sleep mode. All right, so next up, we have the second place prize, which is that $400 eLearn security exam voucher. And the winner is Terrence. S, as in Sam. Congratulations, Terrence. And drum roll, please. I don't know if you can hear that. I'm actually beating on my desk. Uh, but the very first, uh, uh, the, the grand prize for today for that one year INE premium subscription for $750 in access to every single thing that uh, INE has to offer, including the labs, um, as well as the boot camps for an entire year, goes to Joe. M, M is in Mary. 
Well, congratulations to Joe, Terrence, and Carol. Uh, again, we will be contacting you and giving you specific instructions on how to claim that prize. All right, let's go back to some additional questions. You ready, Philip? Yeah, all right. Awesome. <clears throat> With that, just in case, because I know people were uh, mentioning it and they're always curious, there is that picture of Phil wrestling the bear. Yeah, I was <laughs> young at one time and I had hair. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. That's why I really enjoy wearing hats. Hair, but... <laughs> hair, hair today, gone tomorrow. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, let's go over some other ones. All right. So how can pen testing help in DFIR or uh, digital forensics? Um, some people use the term DFIR to include DF, meaning digital forensics, and IR for incident response. Other people use the term digital forensics in a slightly different way. Why don't we just use it as, as the general defensive term for forensics and incident response, which probably goes more towards investigating things that are happening in your environment. But how can we apply pen testing skills to that area? Yeah, if you understand the different types of attacks, that's going to help you be a better investigator because you take someone without the understanding. And, and after time, you know, someone that is doing digital forensics are going to pick up some of this stuff as they learn and get experience. But what's going to give you an edge when you're getting started out is you understand different types of attacks, you know, to look for mimicats or different types of attack tools, you know, presence of those and that sort of thing is going to help you investigate. So maybe you got a better idea how the attack is performed because when you understand those tools and attacks, then you understand the circumstances, how they could be used to possibly exploit something. So that's going to help on that. And even like doing even a SOC analyst, you'll be able to detect malicious traffic is going to help you be better at your job as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this kind of goes along with the question that we often get, and I'm seeing it here a little bit. Um, what, what's a good next step? So I'll tackle that and then you can offer your feedback as well. So a lot of people are saying, all right, I did the PTP course on INE. I passed my EJPT certification through eLearn Security. What do I do next? Honestly, short answer is, I don't know. What do you like? What do you wanna do? But if I were to give you some advice on ways to figure out what it is that you like, because some people don't even know what they don't know. So they, they don't even know what the field has to offer. Where can I go in this? What can I do? So what we recommend, not only as a good first step for people who are just entering the industry, as well as our very own INE employees, is to do that pen testing student course first. Then we recommend moving over to the incident handling and response course. That is our entry level defensive course. Because what you need to remember is that probably, honestly, 90, 95% of the cybersecurity industry out there is actually on the defending side. There's really not, it's, it's not that big of a community or, uh, you know, there, there's not that many jobs uh, in comparison when you're looking at the red team or the attacking side. And, and you can think about it, that makes sense, doesn't it? Most of the people who work in the IT department are either trying to fix things or prevent people from getting in. Um, they either have to hire somebody on the outside to then do a pen test or eventually hire their own team or promote from within. But most of what you are going to do is on the defensive side. So that's why we recommend doing our base level or our entry level blue team certification and course on incident handling and response to not only make you more employable so you can get those jobs like either help desk or a junior SOC analyst, which again helps you catapult your career into those other jobs, whether it be higher end on the defensive side like threat hunting um, or what have you, reverse engineering, there's all kinds of other ones that can go. Or if you wanna go on that red side and you really like it, well then you can expand to do further detailed pen tests on the networking side so you have pen testing professional as well as pen testing advanced. Or you can go specifically again on the red side into web app pen testing, which is very closely tied to, um, to bug bounty. So you can do the web app uh, professional course or the web app advanced. So, but again, you don't really know all these things that you wanna do until you figure out, you know, what gets you excited? What gets you, you know, up in the morning and excited and it keeps your brain going in the middle of the night, all these things. Well, you know what? Start with a little red, do a little blue, figure it out for yourself. And eventually that path will dictate itself for you. Phil? Yeah, what I'd like to add to that as well 
is learning the blue team side, the defensive side, understanding how to remediate those vulnerabilities is, is great. You know, it's easy for anyone to take the recommended information from a vulnerability scanner and say, this is how you remediate it. But if you really understand it, you can do a better job of helping the person you're performing this pen test for to remediate those items. So that's good to know. I know as far as my pen testing experience, what really got me a lot of mileage as being a consultant, a lot of my counterparts just did just regular network pen tests. So all they were doing was server internal or external pen test. But since I knew how to do Wi-Fi pen test and web application pen test, I would be given the whole projects by myself because I knew how to do it. So having some flexibility, there's nothing wrong with specializing. And that's kind of a good thing after you've been in for a while, I kind of recommend that you specialize because these people that are creating these AD tools, uh, you know, people like SpectreOps and, and some of these boutique shops, some people specialize in certain areas, but to really get really highly skilled at some point, you'll need to specialize, but getting started out, it's good to be a generalist to know a little bit about everything. So, you know, after you've completed the professional certification, then in my opinion, if you're more specifically wanting a role as a pen tester, then the web app pen testing would help. And then, you know, there's a lot of bug bounty opportunities. Uh, Cobalt is pen test as a service. You can sign up with them and they give you pen tests. So you do a pen test. I think you get like 30 to 33 hours to test the target and you make like $1,500. I mean, it's, you make a lot more of that once you get into pen testing, but as you've done pen testing, this is on your resume. Now you've got experience pen testing. Yeah, and something else to throw along that, and it, it goes with general career advice. You also have to start to learn who you are and what you like and where you thrive within an organization. So as Philip mentioned, yeah, you could probably make a lot more money um, if you're specialized and you are like, you know, the person that can do this particular thing and you're really, really good at it and those skills are highly sought after. But you also have to keep in mind that it's really only the large companies or those that are providing those pen testing services for other large organizations that will have the need for a specialized person like that. However, if you don't like working for a very large corporation that's just not, you know, a, a comfortable uh, environment for you and you like a smaller area, well, then you're, you're almost forced to be that jack of all trades. And again, you just kind of have to balance that. Um, well, Philip, here's another one for you. You've been on both sides. So you've been uh, someone who was looking for a job and went through interviews. You've also been somebody who ran a pen testing team and had to hire pen testers. So can you talk about uh, some tips and tricks and advice on how to do well on the technical portion of a job interview. Sure. And one of the things I'll share what helped me get my first job as a pen tester, because when I got hired as a pen tester, I'd run vulnerability scanners. I had secure experience applications, secure experience, but I was really missing a lot of things I needed. But what got me hired was the hiring manager saw my passion, that I was really passionate about technology and learning, and also told him that I had a home lab and he saw that I had a home lab that I was continually learning. So those, those helped. So when you're preparing, for, make sure to prepare for your interview. So if you're going in for an interview, uh, most pen test interviews, they're going to, to interview you based on, they're going to ask you questions in OWASP top 10. These are the vulnerabilities that people are going to cover. They're going to ask you not the whole OWASP top 10. They're going to ask you about cross-site scripting, SQL injection. So be able to understand those vulnerabilities and how to remediate those. Uh, that's going to be important. Knowing some of the, the basic stuff, because you get, into senior management, if they're interviewing you, they're kind of far removed from the field. So they're gonna ask you some of the stuff like the three-way TCP handshake and OSI model. So be able to understand that stuff can help. So main thing is prepare for an interview ahead of time, prep for the interview. Don't put things in your resume that you're not really sure about to have a little experience or make sure you put some notation in there that maybe you took a course on it, elaborate. Because when they're looking at your resume, a hiring manager is gonna interview you based on that resume because they're wanting to know how well you know Burp Suite, how well you know Nessus or, or Mesploit. So they're asking you questions about stuff on your resume to get your level of knowledge. So you're kind of dictating the resume. So some people will put tools on there they're really not sure about or they may have ran once, but you're gonna make it more difficult on yourself if you do that. And then one of the, some of the tips that Joe gave on the networking, those are huge. Uh, I've got like four consecutive jobs to where I knew someone within the company and I got past HR. They got my resume to the hiring manager. I've helped people in the local community that I've known 
their skill set, what they want to do, and companies are hiring for them, I, I made referrals. So getting those referrals, knowing people in the industry will help you get around that because sometimes HR really doesn't understand the role that well. You may be perfectly fit for that role, but maybe their definition or what they like to see in a resume doesn't fit and they're not really experts to know that. So the networking is a big thing. And as mentioned before, the volunteering at uh, conferences and stuff, I've seen some of my students that have recommended that they've joined the community. They were new and not very well known, by, but volunteering at a conference, they got to meet a lot of people and get, you know, get known in the community quicker than if they'd went the traditional route. Yeah, that's some great advice. And something else that you brought up uh, sparked another idea uh, that I often tell people. So you brought up the idea about dictating the job interview based on what's on your resume. So once you do get that job interview, sometimes you have a little bit more power than you realize. So two things that I recommend to people to always remember is that, first of all, you're not there just to be interviewed by them. You're actually there to interview them to see if you're a fit for them as well as they're a fit for you. So always keep that in mind. I know it's difficult sometimes when, you know, it's so hard to get that job interview and, you know, you need that job. You got to support your family. You got to support yourself. I, I get it. But sometimes keep in mind that you can take this job because of either the money or it's because the only one that's available, but you have full autonomy to control your life in any way you want. If you're not comfortable there, leave. If you want to do something else and maybe you want to do it within that company, you let them know. It, it really is, um, uh, it, I, I, again, I, I get it. There are some people who just aren't in that place in their career, but eventually you want to get to the place where you are um, basically dictating your own path. Something else to keep in mind is that you can also help dictate the process of where the interviewing process goes next. So as an example, Phil said, if you listed a number of different tools that you know, well, because of the maturation of the industry and people's security programs within their own organizations are becoming bigger and better all the time, they actually now have the ability to say, oh, well, you can do this. Well, here's a computer right here in our conference room. Go show us how you would do that you're going to be up the creek without a paddle, as they say, if you put something on your resume and you don't know it. On the other hand, you can also help dictate that by saying things like, you know what, well, things like, you know, these CompTIA certifications may have gotten my foot in the door, but that's not really what made me prepared for this job. I have this certification through eLearn Security, and I took training through INE that allowed me to do hands-on practical uh, and get hands-on practical experience with all of these tools. And that is really what prepared me. So you, you can tout your own credentials and how that prepared you for the job. And they may go, wow, you know, I never heard of eLearn Security. I didn't know how great they were, but I'm glad that you shared that with me. Because again, as Phil said, you may think that, you know, either they should know that or, you know, who am I to tout who I am or what I'm doing or the credential that I decided to go for. Well, shouldn't that be INE's job or eLearn Security's job? But on the other hand, it wasn't necessarily anybody's job to tell them that, hey, Phil, you had a, a home lab and this is what you put on it and this is what you did and this is the blog that you have and this is where I stream and these are all, it, it all completes the picture of who you are and why you are right for that job. Um, here's something good for you that you can, um, I, I, I think it's a good question. I'm not sure how, how we can best answer it for the entire audience, but I just, I thought the question was really cool. Any tips on focusing better? I really get excited with all things hacking and want to do it all at once. Red team, blue team, build things, CTS, bug bounties, everything. Do you think it's good uh, to try a bit of everything or should you focus on one thing and learn it before moving to the next? Um, I know in this industry, there's a lot of people with ADHD. And like I, I often tell people, including my son, one day ADHD will prove to be your superpower. So it's learning to be able to either hyper-focus on something or control where that focus is. So I totally get it. And there's plenty of people in this industry that have that focus issue. 
either they focus too hard on one thing and they can't do everything else, or they're so scatterbrained, they want to do everything else, and they go, ooh, bug bounty, <laughs> ooh, CTF, <laughs> ooh, web apps, <laughs> ooh, reverse engineering, that yes, sometimes it is hard. So what I recommend to my son and anyone else who is uh, dealing with that structure, structure will work for you. Structure will allow you to not only hone all your ideas, but it helps you not get so, uh, you know, scatterbrained. And in fact, within that schedule, uh, you need to put in time for you to have free thinking time or go outside and run around the block five times or whatever that is. But you need to say, all right, what are the things I want to learn? I'm going to spend this weekend learning this, and then I'm going to get back to work. Next weekend, I'm going to do this and then get back to work. Or I'm going to spend an hour uh, learning web apps. And then the next hour, I'm going to shift that a little bit over to network pen testing. Or, hey, here's a new tool that might help me. I'm going to spend you know, the next four hours as soon as I get off of work and after I eat and maybe play with the kids a little bit. When they go to bed, I'm going to do nothing but learn that tool. So yes, sometimes that means that sleep goes a little lower in their priority list. Um, but being more organized and a little disciplined in your planning, um, I, I think that helps a lot. Phil, what are your thoughts on that? I agree with that. I think having the plan, one of the things you have to look at too is you figure when you're in high school or college, you think of all the different subjects that you've got to learn in the day. So there's nothing wrong with if you wanted to learn web app pen testing along with learning network pen testing, just as Don said, you know, have some structure, take, you know, a set amount of time to work on that and just kind of stick to your plan and then have like, I like the idea of having some play time. So if you just wanted to go do hack the box or try hack me just to, to practice your hacking skills, do that. So, you know, just kind of have some structure. I, I would think in one of the things Don, that, that really impressed me with Don and working with him is why he's such a good polished professional is he plans things. So if you plan things, you're gonna come out with a better outcome than if you just wing it. So if you structure that, your time out and, you know, and then give yourself some time just to get away from it. One of the things I think you should do, even though you're, you may be really loving it now is plan in some breaks because one of the things I've learned from, from athletics, from being a power lifter is if I go all out 100 miles an hour all the time and I don't rest, eventually I'm going to break or something's going to happen. I'm going to have to take the rest. So schedule in some downtime, schedule like a time with your family, you know, if you like going to movies, whatever activity you like to do, get outside, get breaks away from technology too, because what happens if you're in it, you're going to eventually get burned out. So make sure just like getting burned out with work, you're going to get burned out studying. So make sure to take time away from it. Sometimes it's good to have separate environments from your learning environment and your working environment. So you've been at the computer working all day and you learn in the same place. Sometimes it's hard to focus. So maybe you have a dedicated learning area, but just being structured, like Don said, I agree with that. Yeah. And just like your muscles need time for recovery, so does your brain. It's, it's as simple as that. Um, we get a lot of questions here on the amount of time that it takes for certain things. So I'll, I'll attack one of these and then I'll, I'll throw it towards you, Phil. Okay. Um, somebody's asking, how long does it take to do some of these courses? Um, as always, it, there's a lot of variables that go into that, but we do have some ways that we'd like to put it so that way, at least it's in terms that you can understand or something that's familiar. If you are, let's say you have some IT experience um, doing the EJPT and, of course, doing the uh, PTS course to prepare you for the EJPT exam, think of it as being maybe four to eight weeks, depending on your level of experience. If you have no experience whatsoever, well, first of all, don't be nervous. Dive right in because, again, we released a blog post from our very own Lily Clark, who actually did just that, but it took her a year. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. She had zero uh, technological experience, but she used the prerequisite materials that are in the PTS course in order to learn things like what's the industry like, what are some terms, what's things like you know, basic networking, uh, binary arithmetic. There's all these things that you can learn um, in the first course that goes along with that learning path. The second one is all about programming. 
So if you've never learned programming before, there you go. So you go through a lot of prerequisite material in the PTS course, even before you get to that area that teaches you the full methodology of how to do a pen test. But in addition to that, because now the INE platform gives you access to everything, you can now go study all those things from different instructors or go do a deep dive into a particular technology that you feel that you want to learn a little more before you move on. So with that, again, your time may vary. It took literally a year. Uh, some people who have experience can take you know, four to eight weeks. I've even seen some people who have a lot of experience, they just never really had the ability to connect the dots because they did all this research and they're, they're doing Try Hack Me and uh, Vuln Hub and all these other things. They're watching YouTube videos and reading articles and, and walkthroughs from CTFs. They just can't connect the dots. And so finally, when you see the exact method of how you're supposed to study and it's laid out with slides, videos, you do a lab to reinforce that with hands-on material. You go to the next thing and it's you know rinse and repeat. So they were able to do it in like two weeks. I, I, I've seen some amazing stories of the amount of time, the short amount of time it takes some people to go through our courses. But that's a good example for a pen testing student and EJPT. When it comes to something like all of our other courses, like pen testing professional to prepare you for the ECPPT, kind of think of it more along the lines of a full semester of a university course. So again, some people can cram all that in and do it in you know two to four weeks. Other people, it may take longer. And again, if it takes you you know twice to take that course in order to pass it, well, it may take you two semesters or a full year. I, again, don't be discouraged by that because the end goal is really what you're trying to reach. Um, so with that, Phil, how long did it necessarily take you, maybe not to go through the INE eLearn security stuff, but how long did it take you to feel comfortable in being proficient enough to try and do this for a living? Well, I actually was in the job and started learning as I went along. So I, like I said, I when I got into pen testing, I'd run web app vulnerability scanners. I've ran like vulnerability scanners. So I was kind of in it and I was doing the job. And that's a lot of the reason I started taking some of the training that I did. I mean- <laughs> Maybe some uh, of the benefits of being old guys, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's just jumping in and learning it. But one of the things I would like to share is while you're doing this, take the time to learn it because what happens sometimes people get in too big a rush to hit that end goal, to get that certification and they don't retain it. So the really work on learning. There's a, a guy that I mentor that he just had his three-year anniversary as a pen tester, a good friend of mine. We met back in our AutoCAD drafting days and I got him an interview with the company I was working for. He's been working there for three years. But one of the things about this guy is he takes the time to understand what's going on. He just doesn't learn, take crack map, exec, a password hacking tool. He doesn't just learn how to do the, the minor stuff. He learns the tool, how to use it, understands the technology and why. So really understand what you're learning. And then when you move to the next level, learn something else you're going to, you're going to understand because a lot of times what we do is we rush through things and then we go, got to go back and relearn it when we start another course. So take your time learning. Some people learn quicker than others with pen testing. This was like one of the most difficult things for me to learn. It took time, but then once I got the basics down, it was easy to learn new things. So don't let, the initial difficulty scare you off. Just stick with it. And once you learn it, then you'll progress and you can learn more uh, advanced techniques and stuff. Sorry about that. Uh, we've been going for about an hour and a half now, and we still have over 170 people uh, keeping up with us. So you know what, Phil, if you have the stamina and the time, I'm willing to go for a few more if you are. Yeah, let's do it. All right, cool. Um, with that, just in case anybody has to leave, and uh, I apologize, Emma, I didn't do an official wrap up of the video, so that way you knew exactly where to cut it. Um, we definitely want to thank everybody for their time, uh, not only for today, but everything that you've participated in all week. Hopefully you enjoyed the content that we presented, and uh, we will be doing a lot more of this type of content. Uh, for i &E, not only with uh, blog posts, but videos, webinars. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, thank you for joining us during the Cybersecurity Week. With that, we want to thank you. And until next time, happy hacking.